efforts, and yet they're working in like a post-industrial, you know, service economy. tobacco but it would be kind of dangerous because you can actually overdose on tobacco right um i think that's why people don't do that i mean like obviously you can absorb it through your skin because that's what uh chewing tobacco is all about mm. tobacco coffee is like gotten so fastened to exterior manipulation and getting high on it that it's like too much I guess Adderall is and speed in general is mm -hmm. the expression of <clears throat> that unbalanced yeah unbalanced launching into the physical world <laughs> with no cross reference with your actual physical inner state yeah yeah I don't fuck with Adderall <sighs> It seems uh, so obviously counterproductive. Really? I have the opposite perspective. I think it would be extremely productive, and that's the pre reason why I don't fuck with it. Because I mean, I, there's, there's productive and there's productive. Okay, sure. <laughs> there's a short-term and long-term. Productive of crafting your soul, mm -hmm. which is what physical production should be about at the end of the day. It's like that metric. It's like that question of metrics. Like, if you design a car around, um, you know, a safety rating, fuel economy, and buyer's expectations, you're going to get a certain kind of car. And you're going to be able to produce that kind of car very reliably. But at the end of the day, the, the tragedy is that you won't even know that you're missing something. Yeah, the soul hasn't been developed. It's just going by a momentum. Just copying what worked before. Yeah. Which is good. Uh, that's the conservative principle, is that and don't fix what's not broken and let the things that are still working be copied forward infinitely while you work on what you actually care about innovating. Well, we can't come to an agreement about what the definition of broken is because that includes a bunch of values <laughs> that are not really illuminated or talked about very much <clears throat> like what do we want in a car for instance what well, it means things different things to different people i know a uh my oh the we, oh, fuck i'm immediately trying to weave three different things good together um and i'm high <sighs> okay Okay. God damn it. Well, we'll have to like come into it and read. Okay, okay, it nice, nice. Zoop, <clears throat> zip around it so we get everything. Yeah. Um, but uh, the the prompt was uh, how we're with with the technology that you are making and many other people are making. We're gonna be able to record the fact of our. Uh, digital existence. Um, you've got another one. Fuckers. You know what the worst thing about ants is? The way they smell. I hate the smell of ants. Yeah. That's a deep instinctual uh, thing, I think. Okay, sorry, continue. <laughs> uh, we're going to be able to record our actions that happen online um, indelibly into the digital fabric such that they cannot be erased ever. And we're getting better and better and better at that. And, like, we're going to be able to, like, upload my first album to Satellite and then my second album, and these things will last. And that's an ongoing question of how do we, like, make things that last and aren't swept away by time. Mm -hmm. In a thousand years, you'll be able to access them like this. And that's a matter of engineering, and that's also on my end of uh, talent. That's on the the metaphysical stability of it? Is it good art? Is it well-made art? Is it meaningful? Um, is it a meaningful integration of something? 
uh, is they're getting better and better at making things that last. And then my prompt was, when you're making something, when when we when we then start to make things that are ultimately stable like that, is that going to open up a phone call with the future in some apparently supernatural way? Because it's more physically impacting all the probable futures from now, like more than it ever was able to physically before. We were never physically able to make something so stable before. But like objectively knowing something will last 200 years creates a connection between you and whoever is alive 200 years from now or all the probable yeah. paths of all the probable people who uh, in their own times are affected by this thing 200 years in their past. So does that open up some kind of a subconscious or even conscious connection between you and the people in the future who are going to, who are seeing what you've made. And so an example of super stable, uh, construction is the pyramids of Gaza. And so the Giza, I believe it's G A Z A. Isn't it? Isn't it? I thought Gaza was the, uh, Israeli. Oh yeah. Well, I always get those two mixed up too. It's time stamped now, so. Mm. Uh, pyramids of Giza, uh, maybe. Um, they were making something so stable. It was gonna last so long. Did they, were they getting, were the architects getting, I'm not even fucking plugged in. Uh, here we go. Seems like it was on the desk, so. Yeah, it should be fine. <laughs> You're talking loud too, so it works. I always talk loud, yeah. Yeah, I always like say stuff really quietly, so I gotta have my mic. Uh, those pyramids, they were built so stably. Were the architects receiving messages from the future about like how to build it or what the effects of it might be? while they were building it, did some fucking line of communication open up while they were making it that kind of like maybe subconsciously gave them just a hot, cold sense of like where to place things because when they placed things in a certain way, they felt this connection to all of time. When they placed it a different way, it didn't feel that way. Um, yeah, I think maybe a, a way of looking at that is like the architects were um, building, like you, if you were to ask them what are they building, you know, they'd say we're building a pyramid, but the object, like, you know, you um, a, <clears throat> a pyramid is just something you, we talk about, like we talk about things because it's uh, useful to parcelize the world into discrete un semantic units. Um, but the truth is that So like, they were saying they were doing one thing, but they were feeling- Well, what I mean is that like you can draw a line around any region of space and time and call it a thing or an event. Um, like the construction of the pyramids or the pyramids. You can say, you know, for the purposes of a language, it makes sense to talk about those, that thing as being something like it started and then they were done and then that was that. But, um, you know, if you look at the system as being like all of the books that have ever been written about the pyramids and will be written about the pyramids in this conversation, we're still talking about them. In some sense, those architects were building this conversation 3,000 years ago, but they didn't know it. Um, yeah. I think that's a way of looking at it is that like, it's, I think that the, there's, there's alternative ways to look at it. You can look at like the future sending messages back there's that perspective, but then there's like the past sending messages into the far future way of looking at it. Uh, both of those things have a linkage. Um, I think the direction of the message is almost just kind of an artifact of whatever, whatever way you want to think about it. I'm not sure how important that is. The point is there's a connection between two disparate points of time that has the capacity to 
um, carry information to affect the dynamics of the system as it evolves. Like, um, you know, I, I think it's pretty, pretty clear that information has the ability to teleport itself to affect the physical world um, irrespective of the normal laws of physics as we understand them. Like a thought experiment that I've thought of before to kind of illustrate this is like imagining some like old Greek dude like Archimedes or whatever and he's like writing a, some old Greek book thing or something and he's like ch chiseling on a tablet or whatever, whatever it is that they do, right? And so he's like chiseling the letters, chiseling them, chiseling them. And then like, um, you know, like let's zoom in on like a specific second, a specific moment of him doing this. Okay, he's, he's, he's chiseling the letter theta. That's a Greek letter, right? Okay, this, so okay. we're getting in the weeds here, but let's say he's, so he's, he's, he's drawing the circle, right? He's, and, and so um, he, he draws the circle and then he continues and then he dies and then 3,000 years passes. Okay. Um, 3,000 years later, some archeologist from the university of wherever, it doesn't matter, digs up that tablet and is like transcribing it onto a computer, right? And he goes, what's that letter? Oh, uh, is that a, oh, that's theta. Okay, so I'm gonna push this key to transcribe that. So if, if, if 3,000 years ago, um, Archimedes or whatever, the old Greek dudes, if he would have moved his hand in a little bit different way, that would have altered the physical process 3,000 years later. Um, so, you know, you can't, if you conceive of the world as like the billiards ball approach, where you go, well, the linkages between physical events are always explainable due to the fact that like this molecule hit this molecule and transferred some kinetic energy. And then like yeah. the world is just this thingy where the only inform information only moves piece to piece to piece to piece to piece to piece like dominoes and there isn't these teleportation events, then you can't explain that because there's no way that the slight movement of his hand drawing that letter was the cause in a physical Newtonian sense of that grad student transcribing that 3,000 years later. Clearly, there was an encoding of information that sort of like abstractly mapped a physical process onto something that was in some sense outside of the world of momentum and energy and kinetics and all that stuff. And it was this hyper, almost like kind of Akashic um, manifestation of information that, um, yeah, he was. So, so, so the, the, the human brain, the human culture was the conduit that that information teleported. And it, but, and then it, so it's like a physical process that dipped underneath the surface and yeah. then popped back up somewhere. There's like a, there's a way in which the, the language, the written language is a, is a riff on the inner experience of like inner shapes and molecules and genes and DNA and stuff. And that's what Archimedes has in common with the grad student. So they're both unconsciously referring to the same like biological organism from which their different languages and symbol sets come out of. And so there's an intuition on the part of the grad student of, oh, he meant this letter. Yeah, so that commonality almost composes it, that those, like, people compose their own stage or context where a new kind of physics can play out that only has tenuous linkages with the physical world, but that those tenuous linkages are enough to pass information back and forth. Um, yeah, I don't know, this is actually, this is really funny. This reminds me of something in software. This is like, reminds me of like threading basically, where you can have like one process in a program that's happening and it's computing information and then it takes a little bit of some parameters and it passes it to a different thread, which then does some stuff completely independently and then just when it's done, calls back to the original thread and goes, here's the thing you asked for. Mm -hmm. and, and the context in which this is being computed has nothing to do with the context that it originated from other than the fact that, that it told it to do that. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like what happened, you know, that's what culture is doing is culture is like this independent thread of the world. It's like a branch of physical well, dynamics which like, is doing its own thing. It's kind of like Chinese industry. Like the Chinese mind is so different than the Judeo-Christian Western mind. 
but then the Judeo-Christian Western mind sends Apple computer designs over, tells them what to make. It's a completely different um, way of life and way of thinking and value set over there, but then they make the computers anyway and send them back. You know, here, yeah. here are the designs. Well, there's something really productive about the ability to um, have a kind of encapsulization of process. Um, I think because it, it insulates the overall system from failure because you can have independent contexts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like cellular integrity. Exactly. So I was thinking of the pyramids of Giza thing and the feedback from the future while you're making your thing and asking myself if there's any examples of that in my own experience. And the, the present example is just Porsche and nice cars. Oh, yeah? Specifically Porsche and uh, the 718 Cayman or the 911 Carrera or any of the um, beautiful 911s that have been made throughout the decades. <coughs> and uh, this, uh, devel this f developing physical sense of pleasure when I see a nice Porsche. <laughs> Um, at, uh, resulting from my uh, kind of intu intuitive prophecy goal setting thing of a uh, couple months back, like I I've, I want my first Porsche uh, within five years. Mm -hmm. And oh, it seems totally doable. And now there's this like felt it's the way that future feedback thing has been experienced with me recently has simply been with emotions. And that's what emotions are for. So you set goals and then your emotions give you a hot, cold sense of if you're on li in line with your conscious goals or off the track of your conscious goals. And feeling good means you're on the right trajectory. Um, so, uh, like the future, the the number of probable futures where I have a Porsche or two or three in the next five years is like talking to me through my emotions, I guess. Yeah. And talking to me through the specific cars I see um, by that company that I like in, during the day. Well, maybe what you're speaking to is like an attitude that treats the future as if it's as real as the present instead of having the future be a kind of provisional um, reality. Because, uh, you know, you can look at it like in, there is one future and it is not quite real yet. Or you could look at it like there are many futures. They're all just as real as the present but they're kind of in competition with each other. And so what you see as the future is the one that you um, are looking at at the moment and that you kind of have a choice. Uh, I think that's probably more true. The fact like uh, conceiving of it in the kind of like multi future way of looking at things, because you can look at the future sometimes and you have an extremely um, like, um, Excuse me. Visceral or like an extremely like vibrant image of what the future looks like, and uh, I think if the future was not as real as the present, you wouldn't quite, you wouldn't have that sensation. Like the fact that your emotion can latch on to that. Well, there's certain futures that are healthier for you than others, mm, and those sure. ones and those ones light up your body, and like make you feel good, or even activate your entire physical mechanism and set you building a website and uh, building a new technology. Yeah. Um, or and making then a there's fucking, a, <laughs> making a heavy metal album. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, still not sure which one takes more work. <laughs> I yeah. think they're, they're both in the same class of just like insane, <laughs> yeah. insane, you, yeah. in, things that you'd have to be absolutely insane to start doing. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then that's another thing of like, uh, growing up, what do I want to do? 
sensing how I feel when I'm on one career path or another throughout college and stuff, or like as a musician, trying to be a musician growing up and this instrument, I've been playing this for a year, I've been playing that for a year, how did, how's this feel, how's that feel? Yeah. And um, then some, some of, some paths just like, fall off as soon as something like uh, adversarial happens and you're like, oh, I didn't really care about it anyway. Then other things like latch on to you and you latch on to them. And uh, oh, what I started out meaning to say was like, the more stable, practical, common sense career paths suggested by my parents and parent-like figures, I could tell they weren't healthy for me by how fucking bored I was yeah. by contemplating that. And I wouldn't be like, and part of like being a musician in general uh, and making a career, daring to build a career out of that is like, well, it's exciting because it's impossible. Like why, how, how could I be excited about um, uh, w something to devote my life to if it was like risk-free and predictable. Um, I was reading an article a few days ago. Like that doesn't say anything about the human spirit. Mm. Like, oh, you, you went on a totally stable path and you <laughs> got there and congratulations, you like achieved nothing for anyone to admire. Well, there's something there about um, feeling demotivated um, and that being kind of a signal to you. I was reading this article a couple of days ago about uh, writer's block, and the basic thesis of this article was that um, writer's block um, just means you're lying to yourself. And I was <laughs> like thinking about that for a second. I was like, well, okay, what's what's this all about? And the basic argument was that um, you know if you're not excited about writing something. Uh, you are writing about something that you don't care about. And um, writing, if you care about something, as I think, I, you know, as I've experienced and as many people who have ever written anything have experienced, hopefully, is very exciting when you actually care deeply about what it is that you are writing. If you have something to say, you care about saying it, and you know what you need to say, writing is really simple. You just put the words on the paper from your mind. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I was trying to generalize this idea, like I usually do, towards like life to, to life in general, and relate this to programming, or relates to creative work. Is that, like, I've been. I think when you, it's good when you feel that sense of adversity, to have like a sense of gratitude for the fact that your deep unconscious is telling you, you don't actually want this. So stop wasting energy on it. Mm -hmm. So instead of being like, oh, I'm so lazy. This is, uh, I just need to power through this. Like, don't, don't do that. Maybe question yourself and be like, do I even give a fuck about this? Am I actually, what am I doing? Why, I, I, it's like a impulse that slows you down for your own good so you don't go off into the weeds and then have to backtrack. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something analogous to this future hot, cold sense. And... Um, to the extent that you have an imagination in the present that's capable of running a simulation of the future in your present experience, you're going to have a more high fidelity signal coming back to you from that future in the sense of that emotional, um, that emotional reaction you have. So, uh, yeah, this is a bit of a double-edged sword. There's, I think there's this knife edge between imagining the future in a way that it can speak to you but also leaving it um, unconscious enough this is calling back to last discussion like unconscious enough that you don't start making decisions based on a contrived set of metrics of what it is that you are trying to do um, and I think that requires almost articulating what you're trying to do in an archetypical or thematic or symbolic or uh, emotional yeah. language so that it can naturally resist the kind of metri metrification and stupefaction that occurs in, you know, like... like the, well, the archetype of what you're trying to do or trying to achieve 
is much more available to you in the present moment right now than like being already at the finish line of the project in the high resolution exact sense of what you're building. Like that requires time, you're not there yet. But distilling what that high resolution finished thing means to you in archetypal terms, it, uh, it gives itself to like uh, a, a way of being and an attitude. It's and really a, important and a, work. And a moral set. Yeah. And those are all things you can be right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think those are those are the things I started with. Actually, um, fortunately, I didn't know what the hell I was doing when I started because. I like I think I think if I knew what I was doing when I started I wouldn't have done it. It's like you you know like people who I think the thing is is like people who claim or I heard this before and maybe this is a little bit mean or something but there's this idea that like if you need if you're someone who if you need book recommendations you really don't enjoy reading or if you need um, music recommendations you don't really enjoy music like if you are if you're going out and soliciting contact with something that you think is good for you you're putting the cart before the horse in a sense that like you know in within each person there is a kind of latent motivation that is kind of needing a conduit to express itself and uh you just have to hope that you find that conduit. I think if you go out and you try to seek modes of creative expression that aren't you, you're, what, you're, what you're liable to do is just frustrate yourself because you're not gonna have as much success as you imagine that you should have or that other people have um, when they started with something that they just had to do because they can't explain why. They just, they build their life around you know something that is, you know, you start with the motivation and you find the means. You mm -hmm. don't s figure out, look at the means and then try to summon the motivation. It's like backwards. Um, and, you know, the good news is, you know, humans, beings are like vast wellsprings of inspiration. Um, but I think most of the mythological material that is in people is not hewn to an extent that it's recognizable and like interfaceable with the present reality that we're in. If we're just living in the jungle, it's like, well, here you go. You have a lot of off the shelf motivations that make a lot of sense to you. Mm -hmm. You know, like food, sex, mm -hmm. um, sociality, do it. What are you waiting for, right? Mm -hmm. There's no barriers here. You want, the thing you want is exactly what you're set up to get. Mm -hmm. That's a very, um, that's a much easier situation than going like, how do I translate and turn these base instincts to survive, reproduce, and thrive into something that is recognizable as, like, modern or, um, you know, workable in the modern context where you can't just, well, I guess you I suppose you could go live in the woods, but none of us know how to do that anymore, so. Mm -hmm. We've built a virtual jungle that we have to live in now, and it's like a constant race against our own environment changing. It's like we are trying to keep up with it. That's the real future speaking to us thing. It's a kind of ecological tension. It's a tension between the way that we're changing our own incentives. We're like off the rails coming up with new technologies that are not only changing what we have to do to get what we want, but they're changing what we want or how we yeah. have to articulate what it is that we want. So yeah. it's this weird and unstable situation. Yeah. Like privacy, for example, is a perfect example of this. I want um, the ability to have my own thoughts not be read by every other human in the world and every government agency. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem I had to worry about before. Now mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. Technology created the need for me to create technology to hold on to something that before I didn't even know that I needed. Yeah. So it's a perfect way, that, example of how well, we're undermining our own thing, but. That's still the jungle though. Yeah. That's still mm. just like, a new predator has migrated into <laughs> my territory. So I wasn't planning to learn sure. how to climb trees, Sure. but now I'm going to. Adapt or die.
Well, it's all blending. We're in that wormhole that I always talk about. We're still gonna be fucking talking about COVID and bullshit <laughs> a year from now. Yeah, I'm tapering off the amount <laughs> that I think about it personally. Um, I'm taking a more like bemused uh, <laughs> view of the whole situation at some point. Like, it's seeming like it's becoming a little less serious. Well, um, you don't like visit SF. Or, I don't. That's or true. Have any like reason lately to visit any city? That is true. Is it still or is Sacramento? It, like, is it still whack? It's just more and more whack all the time. Really. And so is Seattle, and mm. um, just clamping down. Just the more insane it is to keep uh, caring about vaccination that's how much more important it is to like get vaccinated and check if you're vaccinated at the fucking <laughs> front door of anywhere you want to go into. Oh, have you had and to do that in SF? I just know that that's what it's mm. like there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it is weird how like you can see how the media is kind of milking the fear train for everything it has. Like, um, they're having it's just like almost like we just kind of got accustomed to only paying attention to doom apocalyptic headlines for like two years and so people who make the news just are lazily continuing with their pattern and i think it's like just sliding from panic into a kind of like uninspired like, oh, well, I guess we got to put out some more panic porn. <laughs> and the people who read it are like, yeah, there's some more panic porn. <laughs> well, I do got to go to the grocery store now. Okay. You, you know, so it's like you, like the saving grace of this is just that people will be exhausted after a while. Yeah. And yeah. maybe we just need to, it reminds me of that thing I always, that Alan Watts always says all the time is that like, you know, the fool that persists in his folly will become wise. Um, or the idea that, you know, to achieve enlightenment, you have to do some strict kind of like program where you go through all this asceticism and discipline and stuff. Uh, the whole point being to find out that you don't, you can't really become enlightened because you already were in your state and you're the whole problem, the reason you were weren't enlightened is because you thought that you weren't or something and you spun up this whole idea in your mind that you needed to do something. Um, so you have to kind of prove to yourself that you can't do it or, you know, you can translate this to the Christian idea that like, you know, like you need the grace of God because we are imperfect beings. And so you have to realize that, you know, you blah, 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 blah. Like there's various iterations of this idea of coming in contact with something better by just going through the thing that proves that you don't, that you can't. And maybe that's like what we're doing is we're doing like collective like penitence trip or something in our post Judeo-Christian psyche um, where we're just like punishing ourselves for something um, and feeling bad and shitty. But then after a while, um, apocalyptic doom shit is just gonna become passe. And it's gonna be something that like all these old, you know, millennials just talk about all the time. And like the, isn't that weird? Like we're gonna, people are gonna talk about millennials and all the stupid millennial shit, like we talk we used to talk about like boomers and stuff, you know, being a, like, yeah, our generation is just we're just on the doom train. But sooner or later, there's gonna be a generation, maybe it's already happening, that just doesn't buy that and just doesn't can't, doesn't feel that way, and and thinks that maybe like the new thing is to be not afraid of the future or something, um, and. Because I, I think that people's choices about whether they're afraid, they're not rational. It's, it's more like you feel the way you feel because you sense, you, you have like a scanning mechanism that goes like, you know, like what are other people, what kind of emotions are other people experiencing and how, what are the signals I'm getting from other people about what emotions are appropriate to experience? And then I'm going to experience those emotions. So you just become 
the group consensus about how people feel. I was thinking about that this morning. What is your prediction, for instance, about like how long is, is it going to be time frame wise that people just, that it becomes socially acceptable to feel optimistic? Because I feel like it's not socially acceptable to feel optimistic in mainstream society right now. That's why every single news story about even the most mundane thing has to have like a kind of like, whoa, like little tone to it, to where there's always like this hesitation or there's like this kind of like threat. Um, I wonder when that's going to come back around because it has to, obviously. Maybe like in 10 years, people are going to like be more optimistic or something just because they have to, just for sheer, sheer novelty. <laughs> Five years is my prediction. I, in that sense, I'm a lot more pessimistic. I, I don't see it as like a recent thing that we're not allowed to feel optimistic. I think it's like been, there's a, been a constant boogeyman since we were cave apes. A constant ghost fear, a constant superstition fear. Um, that like rare sparks of optimism have been what like moved us from one uh, stage of development to another. But then the the boogeyman to focus on is just there in brand new clothes uh, in that new landscape too. Yeah, I'm probably just speaking of like we spent mm -hmm. we. Uh, before this, we had the Cold War, and it was just non-stop uh, Red Scare shit. And, like, everything was the end of the world. <clears throat> or was every, every, every disruptive event was billed as the end of the world. Yeah, and that, and then at some point, people just forgot to be afraid of the nuclear apocalypse. And now we're not afraid of it anymore. Even though it totally could happen, we just got bored imagining a future uh -huh. where everything got, you know, we don't hide under our desk anymore. Well, life, at some point you have to, like, forget about it if you're going to keep living. And the species has to do that too. Um. <laughs> Here, you want to hold this? <laughs> you know what's... Okay, this is a side tangent, but you know... Um, I was thinking about this, but I just did this kind of like mm. gesture. You know why primates do this to show this is a gesture. This palm up thing is a gesture that that is evolutionarily hardwired in us as an expression of um, disarmament. Because when you show your palms to another primate, what you're showing is that you don't are not holding a weapon. Right. Whereas if you, if you take the inverse of that palm down, that's just, this is a symbol of aggression. And that's why Hail Hitler salutes like this. <laughs> Seriously. It? Yeah, well, I mean, sure. I think it is. <laughs> okay. If you, can you imagine Hitler going like, like, he goes like, nah, nah. Like people would be like, get out the fuck out of here. Like, no, nah, no, nah, this is just, this looks like you're an idiot. This looks like you're powerful. See, look at the difference between these two things. I mean, maybe this was what was wrong with his whole movement. If he'd just done this, it all would have gone a much better way. He'd have been like, hmm, give it to me, give it to me. <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Like that's, you could go to someone, um, you know, in a completely different, it doesn't matter what culture you're in. This does not look threatening. This looks threatening. This looks like I'm gonna, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It, I don't know. But anyways, that's sorry. Side tangent. I, <laughs> I don't want to derail the thing you were saying. Uh, I don't think we were on rails. I, I, I think. I think. <laughs> yeah. I think. I think that train went off the rails about five minutes ago when I was on my huge rant about like five just, different things. Just talking about the current events is, <laughs> <laughs> by our definition, off the rails. Yeah, it kind of is actually. It's. It's. I don't. I'm bored with. Well, there aren't current events. That, oh, that's, that's my whole theory of the Biden <laughs> era is we don't have current events anymore. We're just sh in shock, recovering. Okay, dude, I had a... Yes, uh, yesterday, I was tripping out because I... Um, 
compulsively like opened up the Google News or whatever just because oh, no. I, 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 like I do it sometimes like almost like these days I do it kind of like as like a little thing to go like <laughs> I wonder what the news is they're talking about just like just as almost like from a little bit of distance from it to like see what is the the thing that you're supposed to think is the what matters or something? Yeah, what so, are we supposed to? What make are we supposed today? to think about it? And yesterday, yesterday I opened up the news and the headline news. Okay, so probably about millions of people per hour are probably opening this page and seeing this. Okay, this is a you know so. Millions of people all over the world are having the experience of seeing the headline, the top story on the, on the number one news aggregator of the world was, and I quote, Judge in the Kyle Rittenhouse case makes an inappropriate Asian joke in the courtroom and I was like oh what did this guy do what did he say oh did he did he did he like oh did, does he hate Asian people I opened I, o- I opened it up and yeah you gotta find out what he said I gotta find out what he said I opened up CNN and I closed fucking 50 different cookie notifications and, and like you know had to like um, had to like go and like inspect element and like edit the um, paywall um, pop, pop up to like make it disappear so I could read the article. That's something you can do, by the way. It's, it's one of the props of being a web developer is you yeah. can just like edit the page and get past pet page. And so, Hacker like, shit. Yeah, you can just like, like, haha, like hack in the matrix, like fuck you, CNN. No, I'm not going to subscribe. Um, so, anyways, I opened it up and apparently what he said, he made some like offhand joke about, he said something like, I guess like apparently the courtroom broke for lunch. And they were ordering Chinese food, and he said something like, I hope that Chinese food isn't on one of those container ships anchored off of Long Beach. And they went away. And CNN took that as like, the fact that he said that Chinese food might be on a container ship as a reference to the ongoing supply chain crisis was perceived by many as a, (laughs) um, you know, potentially insensitive to Asian Americans. I'm like, so the fact that he connected Chinese food to, to uh, where it comes uh, like from. a shipping thing or something was anti, I'm like, what? <laughs> like, are you people are reaching? And, okay, is... and that was the number one story <laughs> in the world. Okay. N- there's nothing more. See, the, 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 what's important for you to take away is that nothing else is happening in the world. <laughs> nothing is important. There's nothing going on right now. In fact, yeah, 2021, you know, we're just all just doing pretty much nothing's happening. So we're going to have yeah. to talk about this guy. Yeah, we certainly aren't murdering people in the Middle East. That's not happening. Or, yeah, like, That's there, not news. There isn't like a war in Ethiopia. There's a war in Ethiopia right now, in case you didn't know. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy shit. Yeah, also, that's something that's happening. You know, like, um, there's really a lot of things happening in the world but it's almost like the news is almost it's getting to a comical level where it's like when you look at it you can start to see it as like this consciousness suppression narrative where the main goal is just to not get you to pay attention to anything it's to redirect all of your emotions and funnel them into this kind of trivial but i think it's getting to the point where like at some point you have to laugh um yeah i don't know it's like that is so in, insane and so many different levels of nested insanity and non-thinking. Uh, like, was that even healthy for you to look at? I think it was, yes. <laughs> it was healthy because I laughed. But I, b- my ability to laugh, I think, has been cultivated through going through, like, 2020 and seeing the kind of mm-hmm. just... um unreality of of it all Mm -hmm. um yeah we're all going to get some distance from this eventually everyone sooner or later is going to be in on the joke Mm. that's where things get interesting these trees look really cool there's like one right there like in the thicket that's coming out and spreading out really beautifully just that middle one in the thicket. Yeah. Yeah. I know, trees have personalities. Anytime I've ever, whenever I've been 
like microdosed on mushrooms. Every time I look at a tree, I look at trees and I start seeing them as individuals more so than just like a backdrop of foliage. Totally. Yeah, you start looking at them and you can start like, like oh, that's... Totally. Well, they're so present. They're so well made. They're built to last. And then you think about the fact that they've, that tree has always been right there. Yeah. It's been there for many, many years and it's never moved and it just lives... Yeah, the it's, acorn dropped yeah. right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's crazy. Like, there's a thought there about mm -hmm. my observation of my creative process lately which is kind of like jamming. And I had a prompt about jamming. Yeah, I wanted to get into that. <sighs> but uh, the creative process I'm commenting on is like jamming, where just there's this zen blank canvas state of mind that I take for granted is active. And I sense it, I gently sense it inside myself and then the first thing that happens is where the acorn falls, metaphorically speaking. And I build on that. It's so like when I'm making a song or when I'm making a beat or something, like it's just the first thing that happens. Like a person walks by in front of me or I like go through the presets of different drum sounds and each group of presets has a different name that the developers called it and I just pick a pleasing name and go like okay Bluebird the drum kit called Bluebird on GarageBand we're just gonna see what Bluebird has to say about today so is, is GarageBand in a way that it has like a developer ecosystem where anyone can contribute like a package of no. sounds? Oh no. Um, no. Well, there's a shop you can draw more sounds into your GarageBand thing, mm -hmm. and that shop is uh, much more curated than like Ableton, um, which is a different DAW, D A W, Digital Audio Workstation. Okay. That's much more open, and anyone can make anything for it. And there's aggregator websites, I'm sure, that rate really high that show you the really high rated um packs of samples that got made recently that everyone's playing with and everyone can contribute to them but GarageBand is uh yeah it's like everything apple it's like they only let a, they only let a certain amount of that shit in so apple has had a huge influence on just music in general by providing a curated set of bass materials by which a lot of music gets produced, huh? And streamlining everything that, uh, like people, it used to cost money to do certain parts of uh, music editing, and then people figured out how computers could do it automatically, and then eventually Apple catches up to that and just puts it in GarageBand without telling you, and now, like the guitar samples or the guitar um, preamps, the guitar presets and the drum presets just come onto your music project mm -hmm. already mixed the way we have discovered guitar should ideally be mixed. It's just recorded from your guitar onto your computer in that already like applying that applying those transformations or whatever well, yeah mm -hmm. and so like for the purposes of the whole aesthetic of garage band being like a kid on a computer can make a track and it sounds good yeah and all he had was a macbook yeah because uh it's just collected all the wisdom of uh digital innovators and made that part of the algorithm of how sounds get made. Do you think Apple does a good enough job curating that to justify the fact that they have a closed ecosystem? I mean, that's a constant, like, dancing act. You, yeah. you pay for it by more discerning people knowing wh where you made your music. Don't, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Sounds like a GarageBand song. 
Um, right, but how many of those people can really tell the difference in the world? Not many, I would imagine. I certainly can't. And it's it's just, it's not about what crayons you have. It's about what you do with <laughs> exactly, the crayons. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. I have, my crayon set is like nine crayons. And um, I... <clears throat> and I still like uh, fancy myself as one of the greatest artists alive now, not because I am very subtle with having a lot of different crayons to use. Like sometimes I just use three different crayons, but it's about having something new to say with those crayons. Yeah, it's like you know, ba like the best, some of the best chefs in the world just cook with the same fucking ingredients everyone else cooks with. Yep. They don't have any special magic there. It's, what you, it's how you put it together. Well, their magic is in caring what, about what they're doing. And for me, my magic is in believing that music and art could actually be valuable in a way beyond having back, background noise on while you do your homework. <sighs> oh, the acorn, the jamming, the like... Well, what, what did you mean about the thing about the um, heavy or uh, metal music being... Would you say it was like a manipulation of electricity? Molding electricity. Molding electricity. Uh, and music, and playing music as molding flows of electricity. So, so metal music specifically has this uh, relationship to electricity that other types of music don't. It's the sound of electricity. It's the sound of electricity. And the, the, dis, the heavily distorted guitar yeah. is just the sound of electricity. And uh, amp distortion on guitar tone is simply the effect of turning the knobs up past the point of what they're supposed to handle, and so it distorts. And there's a whole art form and a whole world yeah. of crafting distortion to make it sound different ways and have it sit in the mix in different ways. Um, but oh. All you're hearing, what you're hearing is just electricity intruding, just pure force intruding on your uh, guitar tone. And when I'm, when I'm jamming with Ade, uh, he often just plays for the entire hour with a distortion guitar tone. So it's just, and because it's very loose and a jam and very intuitive, um, it's these like big flows yeah. of feeling and, and there's a lot of static and a lot of electricity and I'm responding to it with my voice. Like he's, it, uh, he's, he's like, he, his flow, Ade's flow of his emotions turns into electricity and then that electricity uh, played through the speakers is then what powers me to uh, sing with my voice. But then what I'm doing with my voice is just like a different metaphor of electricity. And um, I like see it visually yeah. as these like ribbons of electrical force that I'm like weaving. And they're like coming up out of us uh, into the physical space. And then just like, like he is sending these ribbons of electricity yeah. out into the air. And then I'm responding to them with ribbons that match it, ri ribbons that do a counterpoint sine wave to it, or like are in a harmonic um, interval, like in a pleasing parallel path to it but they're visualized in my mind as these like mm -hmm. ribbons of electricity. So you have like some synesthesia when you're in the jam. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. And I'm just in the acorn falling and then that's where your song grows. Uh, um, just because that's the reality of what it is right there. And you just build on it. Yeah. Um, I just, he just responds with his first feeling and then makes a chord progression and a rhythm. And then I respond with the, f what I build on is just the first thing Ade starts doing. That's, 
Yeah, that's so mysterious how... And then it grows mm -hmm. into like a reality that blooms into existence that never existed before from one like, a, you can call it one arbitrary point or one like mystical sacred point out of all the things that could have happened. This is the one thing that happened. Yeah, it's really crazy to think about that, like how many, you know, like really, um, you know, iconic tunes we have are just somewhere, sometime in someone's mind, there was maybe some little event that just triggered the idea for that sound. And yeah. then now that has grown and bloomed and been recycled and integrated into like thousands and thousands and thousands of other pieces of music. Um, yeah, that's really, there's something very sacred and mysterious about like the origin point of any sort of creative enterprise. And I, I think that, uh, I mean, at least for me, like I don't really know a lot of times when I'm in that point. I don't realize, I don't, I never have the sensation that like, this is a very important moment that I'm coming up with something because I feel like that a lot, but a lot of them are dead ends. So like when you find like that origin point and then you continue it further, you can almost only, it's like you can only perceive an origin in hindsight. Like you don't remember your own birth. Mm -hmm. You don't remember when you were a baby. Mm -hmm. you, there's this weird fuzzy boundary that you infer the existence of the po moment that you started, but you don't, you never really experienced it because it wasn't fully formed. Um, like hey, this is kind of like like childhood amnesia, kind of like that. I wonder if there's something like that in the creative process that you, there's a kind of like amnesia that shields your, shields you from the awareness of like how profound something is when you come up with it. You can't really take it in at that point. You'd get too excited. <laughs> there, <laughs> there's something about, uh, like how we're making this podcast and then it's going to make us money eventually because we're going to keep doing it. Um, we're going to keep doing it because it just fuels us to do it, period. So that like concretizes over time into uh, currency and then that's generative of entire worlds is what we decide to do with currency and, and all the ideas that we make with it and all the ideas that other people who listen get come up with by listening to the ideas we have and so we're making something right now that like doesn't really do to think about too much um beyond right. continuing to make this yeah. podcast and then show up next week make the next podcast yeah um and a lyric of mine comes to mind <coughs> uh the line goes, generative motions looking like the light our children see by. Generative motions looking, light, looking like the light our children see by. Is that a reference to your last name? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not make references but, to my last name. But if you ever become on purpose, if you ever become a luminary figure in the world of music, then people might take a that. luminary figure. But I'm just, yeah, <laughs> I don't want it. A luminary, but it's inevitable. Um, um, yeah. The, this is the generative motion, and it's uh, building itself into a passive active income source that then is the heat of the house that our children are sleeping in. I mean, I'm definitely seeing by the light of people before me. That's right. Yeah. And they weren't like... Specifically my parents. <laughs> And, and to the yeah. extent that they were doing it well, they were more just enjoying the process. I don't think they knew what they were doing. And that's probably why they did a pretty good job. They didn't think about it too much. Yeah, I don't know. I definitely veer towards thinking about it. So do I. So do I. <laughs> Which is why I'm very... One of the things I think about is that I might be thinking about it too much. 
thinking about shit is my native territory. And, uh, you know, there's uh, sophistication in simplicity. And um, I think if you are a true intellectual, one of the things you, a true intellectual, one of the things that you a- arrive at is an awareness of the limitations of thinking. Oh, you have to regularly return to first cause. And I think the first cause is the present moment physically felt experience. And that's where, like, enjoying what you're doing uh, for its own sake right now comes in, independent of uh, your extrapolations of what it leads to. Yeah, I think I'm already getting, I feel like I'm already getting paid for doing this podcast. I'm not getting paid in U.S. dollars, but I'm getting paid in a kind of personal currency that I just have to use, you know? We are being paid... uh, (coughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was like some kind of wildebeest snort right there. Yeah, it's me thinking. Mm. <laughs> mm. It's a very physical process. Very much. So, yeah. We are being paid currently in the form of immunity to ideological psychosis. Yeah. We are immune to the vicissitudes of an unreal and insane world by virtue of thinking. Not just thinking, of thinking in front of someone else that we trust. Not just thinking in front of someone else that we trust. And about 30 people that I don't. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) But packaging it uh, in a way that sticks and uh, sticks around and is like visible to other people. Um, so we're being, we've created our own way through 2020 and through 2021 and we're being paid by health, physical, psychological health is the most immediate form, the paycheck of the podcast has come. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh. Yeah, money is such a strange thing. Money is such a interesting thing um, because it's really easy to only see money as like fungible currency, but money is something much more multi, it's more polymorphous than that. I think uh... money is actually, mo- money is, it's like, it's, it's act- a side effect of what the polymorphic thing you're saying. The money we normally think about with the word money is a second. It's a special case. It's a side effect. uh, um, I don't have have the other fucking super obvious word of that, but it's like besides the point. A corollary. uh, Yeah, it's a besides the point, a corollary of uh, creating value for yourself right now. um, it's like a market evidence that like you're doing something that's maximally valuable to the people around you. Um, but like there's, there's the first cause of money that's more important than chasing money is developing that first cause experience, um, of like this example can only go so far but it's such a handy example in the career of joe rogan where he always insisted on doing what he felt like doing and it was kind of besides the point if it was really profitable for him to do or not uh it's much more important if he enjoyed doing it or not so it's almost like the act of doing what you feel like doing is an expression of money which is not really well, that surprising. It's more, it's more spiritually at the core of what makes money, <laughs> as evidenced well, by yeah, Joe Rogan it, it's really easy, being filthy rich. It's now. really easy to see when it's like if you have, you know, it's really easy to see the the, the connection when you're like, gee, if I had all the mo- if I had a bunch of money, I could do whatever I want. Well, flip that around. Maybe if you did whatever you want, you'd get a b- bunch bunch of money for it. Yeah. Like the, the, the whenever right. you get those. The, there's not too many things in the world that have a fully asymmetrical relationship. There's usually a kind of 
inversion that you can do that, um, you know, and those that, that is suggested by taking a look at the flip side of whatever process you're pretty familiar with. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's like, and the same thing goes with like, um, and you know, we're, we're seeing this in very explicit terms with the way that influence and currency are related in like the social media bullshit world that you can use money to buy influence it's called advertising mm -hmm. um or you can sell influence for money it's called being an influencer right mm -hmm. so our, our language is like really stilted about this because it's a new concept and we're just like sticking these roles onto things that are the most apparent versions of them but um yeah, it's like, what if you were, you know, maybe to, to think about this like in a more personally empowered context and try to like put this in your own center of action, you know, like being an influencer in your own life. Is your ego an influencer? Do, does your thoughts and values and preferences, aesthetic preferences, have any power to affect what happens in your life? Mm -hmm. um, that's right. Yeah, that, that's kind of the thing that I, I think maybe if you're... <laughs> the amount of money you have is kind of a psychological attitude from a, from a certain perspective. It's like, how desperate are you or how, or lack thereof of desperation right. do you have? Cause yeah. you know, desperate people don't how, make how optimum de decisions. How desperate are you versus how um, relaxed and confident if you are were, you? If you were ultimately desperate, let's say you were running from the cops and you were, you would jump off a bridge to escape the cops if you really yeah. didn't, you know, jumping off a bridge is not an ideal decision, but, 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 but desperation forces you into a set of limited options. Uh -huh. And that's why, you know, poverty holds people back. People's, you know, poverty of ideas, poverty of motivation holds people back. You end up making terrible decisions like- Well, I think that's, uh, that's something leveraged by the Democratic Party is they know people who are poor are more desperate so more pliable more pliable so they're not able to make rational decisions about uh, their vote um, they just vote for the person that is saying they're gonna extend a rescue ring and it, throw out into the does, water it does really seem like the democratic party people who are relaxed and confident are able to think rationally about who yeah. they're voting for and go this is what they're saying but they're doing something different this is what he's saying or she's saying and they're actually doing that and those are the results of that mm. and you know and i'm relatively independent of this whole game because like i'm fine I really do wonder. So there, yeah. I mean, there's an incentive mm -hmm. to keep poor people poor sure. on the part of the Democratic Party, and the welfare state has just made things worse for the exact uh, populations of minorities they're supposed to have been helping. But that doesn't mean to adjust or stop the welfare state, because it's that's a group of voters that they get to that they can depend on now. Yeah, I've started to think about this. I've started to... Um, That's all Thomas Sowell Thomas Soul riffing. Stuff. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to take credit for someone else's research. Oh, yeah. You know another dystopian headline that I wrote or read like a few days ago? It was on uh, 538, which is like this like kind of... It's like a polling site or whatever, but it's like sort of aligned with the Democratic establishment. I don't know. They have some decent analysis sometimes, but... They also, you know, publish your standard fair like, mm -hmm. culture war articles. And yep. there was an article that was like, it was like at the, you know, the headline, the very top of the thing. It was like trying to explain why um, voters in Virginia elected um, a Republican. And uh, the lieutenant governor was like this like Jamaican immigrant, like this black woman who was like had like really impeccable credentials and she was actually seems like a pretty legit person yeah and, and so, so they're trying to yeah. bill her as this white supremacist dude oh my god how'd you know i was gonna say that yeah and so <laughs> they the article was it was like it was like it was like why white voters who harbor or why white voters with racist views sometimes vote for black Republicans. Oh my God. And that was like the article and I was like, <laughs> are you people serious? I'm like, I'm like, like, holy shit, did you, like, 
if that is not the most fucking offensive thing you could say, okay, forget about white people, towards fucking black people. It's like, yeah. this black person got elected. Clearly, white people only voted for her because of some, they're actually racist. Like, yeah. I'm, it couldn't possibly be because she, maybe she has impeccable credentials. No way. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't possibly be because she, maybe she's qualified and maybe she said something smart that they agreed with. Couldn't. No, no, no. There's, there's no way. We, we all know black people. The only, You either hate them or love them based on the color of your skin or how <laughs> racist you are. Like, holy cow. I'm sorry. Like, at what point do we admit that, like, the Democrats are not like they're fucking racist man like yeah. it's so racist it's so racist to look at people as like these transactional members of their group like I- i'm not even pretending to be outraged about this i was a little bit offended like i felt like holy sh- i felt like a little bit of indignation like yeah. i'm sorry that it's a, is so it's appropriate fuck- and it's no like literally like if you said like um like that's a fucking offensive to black people and to just the human condition it's, in general, like it's offensive you know, to the individual. Yeah, but the left is not about it's, individuals. It's, it's like, about here's how to stay in this group. Yeah, it's that like makes sure that lets you know you're a sa- one of the saved people. Have, has anyone ever like gone up, gone a few, around and like interviewed like? Um, I, I just wonder how people like. There's got to be a certain segment of minorities that are really not happy about being cast as like just dumb, powerless victim children that need to be managed by a white global financial elite. Like, you know, as, 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 you know, people always like, like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it was like, oh yeah, the Republicans are like, just like the party that protects um, wealth and power. Well, at some point, are we gonna admit that like, Aren't the Democrats the party that protects wealth and power now? Like, they're not the party of the working class. They haven't been since, like, the 70s. I'm not saying the Republicans are either, but we have to be honest about this and go, you really need to stop having this superiority complex where somehow, like, you think that blue states are doing more justice for anyone. Um, It makes me think of the Trump rallies that I drove through a few times in SF proper. Um and they were predominantly Asian. And one of the people there um, waving flags and stuff for the street. Um, And there was one like all Asian Trump rally that was just Asians for Trump. We're all swarming out today. And just block on block on block on block on block was filled with uh, people and flags and waving at cars and cars with flags uh, on their cars, like Asians for Trump, or this Asian country, or that Asian country, that ethnicity for Trump. Um, um, And a big thrust of it being, these are the populations that have literal family members in China getting disappeared because it's a communist dictatorship. And there's only one politician who's like saying that that's bad. And it's Trump. Yeah. You know, man, I really hope Trump doesn't run again. I, I really hope he doesn't. Um, I really hope he doesn't because I want there to be a kind of person with less baggage. I mean, that yeah, can that's, say the most obvious shit. That's, like, that's, that's an unfortunate thing that I had to, like, of course, e- invoke his name. Of course. But it's, it's it, all, it, was of, right. it was of that time. It was 2018. Of course. It was 2019. Of course. I, man, I really, really hope that, like, you just have like someone, well, like for example, the, the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia who just got elected, like someone, I don't care what race you are. If you're just someone who goes like, look, um, we want to um, have, you know, a country where you are allowed to have a job and um, keep most of your money and just have a life and not have your civil liberties violated. And, um, you know, you can just, partake in this experience called life and we recognize that just existing is good and um we can be happy and let's not let's not destroy our whole civilization let's just do that let's just have a baseline level of like appreciation for just 
the beautifulness, like beautiful human beings that can like do something productive and relate to each other in a, and, and try to preserve like a modicum of freedom. Like, can we do that? It's such a simple prescription. Um, you know, we don't need some phantasm of progress to be our guiding light into the future. We don't need that. Everyone's going to figure it out themselves. And the best governments in the world have been those, I think Churchill said that or whatever, but like, so, so, like the best governments are those that just kind of like muddle along and don't have some grand like everyone join my religion kind yeah. of like that yeah. never ends well i don't care how good of an idea it sounds like yeah i'm suspicious of that we don't need prophets yeah. what we need people is to is protect the basic foundations just do that. Yeah, people people create progress like just by breathing. Yeah. If you let them live. Like, okay, you, you want to get excited about some things in life. If you need a politician to tell you why the future is exciting, then that's something you should probably work on. Right. Because you know what you can do in life? You can do things like, I don't know, you can do whatever you want. All you have to do is work a little bit and save up your money and you know you could maybe fall in love you could have sex you can have all the sex you want no one's stopping you you can make all the money you can go you can buy as much mexican food as you want if that's what you think you can buy a house you can buy a motorcycle you can go to an escape room if you're a millennial who doesn't know what to do with their money you (laughs) you can um do you there's all this stuff we're living in a weird like crazy technological playground you can fly across the globe to you know a different exotic locale that like your ancestors could only dream of like yeah um i don't know what is so unappealing about just no, the possibilities just, that are offered you're forgetting you know? you're forgetting that people are scared and when people are scared they look for daddy to tell them how why everything is actually under control and well, I don't know. What I, what I see is people just... People have... People... Trump mm-hmm. what was this uh, foil um, for making people scared of racist, white, uh, redneck people bullying uh, minorities. Right. Right. And a certain amount of that actually happened. And so people were scared. And so they uh, dealt, they exported their rational thought to daddy to tell them why it's all okay and what's being done about it. And then uh, way more existential than Trump was this unknown virus that's gonna come kill you. And like, it's a phantom. Like, it's yeah. much more the reaction to it that was physically dangerous. No, you know what's gonna kill you? You know what's gonna kill you? Is stress. Chronic, exactly. chronic stress. That's what's going to kill you. But that's that locked yeah. in with our creature fear in a very compelling way that virus yeah. did in March 2020. Yeah. Uh, because we live in this technological wonder world and we're separated from nature, but our bodies remember that they, we are vulnerable and we are in the jungle still. And the next day can bring the serpent the next hour can bring the serpent and the serpent can come up from the fucking ground between your feet or from inside you or from inside your spouse and just destroy everything or it can just come up from nature in the form of covid and so that's a very frightening thing to contemplate it's apparently senseless and people get scared and so they short circuit their rational thought and let someone uh, who's willing to come onto a a phone screen and tell you that everything's under control and we found out who the bad guy is and we're working on that. And just you, all of you look out for the bad guy too. Uh, He could be your neighbor, so just watch out. Make sure everyone is like wearing the blue stripe on their sleeve so you know they aren't a bad guy. And so people Uh, who weren't using their freedoms anyway are fine with giving up those freedoms for the sake of stability or safety. Um, But you know what's kind of uh, really... Because then if if they can like Mm -hmm. buy into the safety narrative, they don't have to question their own relationship to the unknown, to the void, to the fact of the serpent. Sure. 
the archetypal serpent. You know, to me, it seems like though, maybe like out, I feel like the elites of our society, the people who kind of steer the narrative, the forces that, you know, are sitting at the board of all the major media corporations that are kind of like <clears throat> selecting what stories to highlight. Mm -hmm. I think that those people are not doing a very good job of projecting stability or certainty. In fact, it seems like they're losing the plot a little and, bit to and me. That's, and that's us, that's you and me in this rant where necessarily to even have this rant, we have to forget that people who even think in left and right terms are fast becoming a new minority of the population. I think most people are in the middle and are focused on their lives and their livelihoods, just want to be the left the fuck alone. But we live in California and we forget that a lot of the country is not insane like this. Chico's pretty sane. Chico's pretty sane, Chico yeah. is, I think Chico is kind of a bastion of sanity in California itself. It is. In some sense, yeah, like we talked about before. Yeah, I, I just think, you know, you... Like, the, it's, mm -hmm. it's object, what you just said is objective. I think a lot of people, an increasing critical mass of people is recognizing that this dumb fuck bald guy, Joe Rogan, has his finger on the pulse more than a CNN commentator or the president and vice president and their entire cabinet of the United States. Well, it just it seems like people who are living and breathing the kind of corporate news narrative are more and more automatons where you just um, keep spitting out thinner and thinner and thinner soup more and more diluted, diluted, not diluted, although perhaps both. Both. Di <laughs> diluted, I'm just gonna say it with a very base American accent so it doesn't, there's no difference, literally. <laughs> diluted. Your message is diluted. <laughs> both senses of the word. <laughs> um, your, yeah, it's, it's becoming more rarefied, kind of, and um, just uh, almost, like it was written by an AI, like it's not differential, you can't differentiate one from the other. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Um, and some, you know, sometimes I wonder like maybe the ultimate, like, you know, the way that you could like free the human populace from like mind control is just to create an AI that produced like a billion stupid articles per second and then flood the internet with like, a bunch of stuff that was super dumb and uninteresting and also indistinguishable from the stuff that other people, you know what I mean? Well, that's kind of like a anarchist pyro. Like culture jamming kind of shit. I get it, but I disaprove of it. Okay, this is, a, again, this is a desperate move. This is a thing born of desperation. This is a, not an ideal option, but it is one kind of like nuclear option to where if you, like, okay, if CNN, for example, like, is running headlines like, judge makes inappropriate Asian yeah. Chinese food joke about, you know, if, okay, yeah. if that can get to the top, well, then that means that I could make an AI right now that didn't make something that would also. So right. it's just about, and so what it's going to become as content, as ideas themselves become more and more just dumbed down and indistinguishable from each other, what that's going to do is it, it's going to move the game into a new territory where it's not the ideas anymore, it's the people that it's saying them that has any credibility. And so we're right. moving back towards a kind of command culture where you just don't take anything at face value, you only take it, the only thing anything means is who said it. Right. And it doesn't, the words don't, you could, you know, you could just be making sounds, but if you're this person, those sounds carry authority and the other, you know. So that like, seems like a huge loss and it seems like you're completely leaving the whole process of, you know, cultural evolution on the table and you're not doing anything with it while you're just listening to shrill people who say nothing. Mm -hmm. So at some point, people who value that kind of intellectual life are going to have to find a new habitat and a new context where they can speak without right. being so, shouted down, so, shouted so, over. So you want culture jamming to happen so that satellite can stick out as a sane option? Not just satellite, my friend, <laughs> but a whole underground movement of people. But mainly satellite. Sure. 
<laughs> Hopefully. But I satellite dot earth. Yeah, some <laughs> I, I want there to be a space where people who are actually interested in what other people have to say cannot waste their time wading through mountains of propaganda to find a nugget of novelty. Mm -hmm. um, and because that's the problem with propaganda is that it's fucking boring. It's not even that it's bad. It's boring. This is an artistic criticism. Mm -hmm. This is not a political criticism. This is an artistic co co comment like, you're, it sucks. What you're doing is, is lame. Mm -hmm. I, if you had cool, clever propaganda, I would probably be less against it mm -hmm. because it would mean that at least in your evil machinations there was some like element of artistic value. And that's entirely possible. I don't think art is good. I think it's powerful. Mm -hmm. Just like human consciousness isn't good, it's powerful. We can do whatever the fuck we want with our conscious mind. Well, that's, that's kind of the sense in which uh, 2016 Bernie Sanders was a, um, an attractive candidate even, and I still like believe in my past self who voted for him, even though I think the whole leftist compassion-based thing is just the wrong way to have bureaucracy sure. function. I just think that's completely wrong from the root. But it's like, that was a real person yeah. saying a real thing backed up by his physical action. As such, it was better art. Yes. than everyone around him. Yeah. And same with Andrew Yang. I don't think a UBI thing is like conducive of creating greatness in the population. Yeah. Um, but it's about who was saying it and what kind of work is backing up right. the man himself and him being a self-made man that like proceeds from thoughts he made himself and then like enacted in the physical world to see if they worked and then came out to talk about them after uh, is just better art than the than all his other peers and so as such like uh way more left i don't think that's good but it's coming from a more real person so it's like uh, uh net uh, net results good to go with someone like Andrew Yang. Yeah, at least because at least he has uh, personality and the ability right. to think. Sure. And the ability to change his thoughts when they're shown to be faulty. Yeah, and you and you can you trust someone who isn't, um, you know, uh, like a lizard. <laughs> yeah. A lizard person. Um, yeah. I think, you know, people, that's like what, that's, that's, that's where that archetype about like lizard people comes from is that like lizards are just like the non-mammalian unfeeling, un, mm -hmm. they're the, you know, reptilian, the reptilian brain is just like, um, it's a metric oriented brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm underselling lizards and we just don't understand them, but <laughs> it's something about the mammalian capacity for like empathy and creativity and adaptability is really great. And you feel like life is lacking when you don't have that authenticity in other people. Um, it's just, I mean, I just think it sucks we have to all pay attention to the same people. That's so boring. Well, we don't have to. Well, it seems like the de facto media streams are reaching everyone. Like, there's like, a, you know, there's right now, there's right driving down the road in San Francisco, or in Palo Alto, someone's commuting, listening to some... <laughs> Uh, offensive, uh, Asian. Uh, uh, oh, that, that that's in their brain. The, that su thought, that simulation is running in their brain. Okay, and then uh -huh. three thousand miles away in New Jersey, same person, same thoughts, same yeah. words, exact same feeling. You, so you're what you're doing. That is a failure of originality. You are having something, a very dumb idea, a very boring idea. That's that's not differentiable between a bunch of other thousands of other ideas that are of the same quality is somehow found itself to the top of the media pyramid. Mm -hmm. And that's like a kind of, it shows you that we have a very non-optimal way of allocating interesting thoughts yeah. when you have thousands of people paying attention to the same boring stuff. Well, it's, it's like that ghost in the shell line when the major is suiting up in the van explaining their attitude to the human driver and going, 
we put you in our police unit, even though you're not super advanced, you're a basic human, but you have your own thoughts. And if you breed homogeneity into the system, it's slow death. Uh, yeah. That's the only word that's actually quoted that I can remember is it's slow death. <laughs> well, that resonates, I think, with the very last ending scene of that movie where they start talking about like the necessity of um, uh, constant uh, death and rebirth and yes. uh, finding what works. And the puppet master was calling, he was arguing against her fear of death. Yeah. to uh, argue for the case of the two of them merging. Uh, her fear was, you're asking me to step over the threshold into death, dude. I don't want to do that. And he's saying constant death and rebirth, anything else is like the big death of just homogenous... Yeah, non-existence. Non-existence. And one virus can come in and wipe out an entire population if they're not a variegated, um, decentralized population. That's why at the end of the day, decentralization will always win no matter what. It's a law of nature. The only thing you can have is localized, centralized regions that exist in a certain place at a certain time. I don't know. I think they give to each other. Like, decentralization is necessary now, because we lack a centralized objective thing that is good. We will do this decentralized thing to find a new revelation of a new thing to centralize around that's objectively better than anything else. And then that'll, and then we'll all unite to that and that'll start a centralizing wave and then that'll necessitate a new realm of rot and stagnancy and decentralization. Yeah. So we're actually, yeah, so we're just in, right now in history in 2021, we're about to, we're just, we're about to go into a giant wave of decentralization. Feels like we have to. Yeah, I def agree. That's definitely the spirit of the times. I agree. Decentralization is the, is the near future. And then I wonder, I wonder if you and I will live long enough to see what the next centralizing wave of human culture is going to look like. That, well, m that well, might be fun. I hope I'm still alive. Well, I will. Well, you will be. You're going to live to 300. <laughs> I hope I am. No, you don't. You don't hope you, don't hope you will. What do you mean? You, no, I don't live. You want to live a normal span life. Yeah, I, no, no, I'm, I'm saying I want to live long enough to experience the recentralization, not to 300. I don't want to do that. But you, you, you wanna you wanna have your normal lifespan more be, be enough, yeah. more than you want to actually see that next wave. If you sure, if you wanted sure. to see that next wave more, yeah, then right. you would open yourself to ideas of what sure. would want to change if I maybe wanted to live to 120, right, 140, right, right, right. right. Yeah, I don't, I don't want. You don't, you don't care enough. Nah, I don't want to live. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to have a amount that I live want to live to. I just. I don't know what's. I'm gonna live however I'm gonna, long I'm gonna live. That's all I know. I don't. <laughs> it's not gonna be my. Put it this way: when I die, it's not gonna be by choice. <laughs> <laughs> sure, but by doing that, you're making it by choice. Uh, you are making a choice. Yeah, but I don't know. I guess I just. I figure I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe uh, if we get nanobots and we can repair our bodies and we can start creating new organs, synthesize them and implant them as they go bad, you know, like maybe, yeah. But uh, maybe I'll be forced with the choice. Maybe I will have to choose to die at some point and just be like, no, nah, I don't want to become a Because cyborg. it becomes optional. Mm-hmm. It becomes like a thing where it's like, well, you could just die and then hope you know, roll the dice or you can continue clinging to existence. I'm not sure what I would do. Probably depends what my life was like at that time. If I was, honestly, it probably depends on who's still alive that I care about. Mm -hmm. And also, if I'm working on interesting, anything interesting that I feel like I need to finish. Mm -hmm. I th I, sometimes I imagine like, <clears throat> if I got diagnosed and they're like, it's like, son, you have a metastatic stage four cancer of the everything you, know, you have <laughs> yeah. six months to, six months to live yeah i would you know what i would do i'd be like holy fuck i have to finish satellite that's what i would think yeah 
Well, and also probably like spend time with the people I love and stuff like that. But also finish satellite. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go out. Go to Vegas. I wouldn't. No, fuck that. No, I have work to do. Yeah. I already feel like I'm gonna die at some point, so I have to do something worthwhile before I die. I don't want to like have it all for naught. I don't want to have all this unknown code sitting in a random GitHub repo. It needs to be like deployed. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so that's that's a sense of urgency right there. I think. And my age goal thing is uh, like my version of uh, engineering and my version of like creating a new set of code, a new set of programming to update the whole human OS. Mm -hmm. um, like that's the level of code I feel like I could maybe contribute something to the social fabric. Sure you can. Is uh, if I can provide objective evidence of living longer than other people. Oh, interesting. And a body of work that explained uh, how I did it. Yeah. Um, then I've changed the code of our beliefs. Not the code of our computers, but the code, the the biological mind matter OS code of what we believe about humanity. It's computers all the way down, my friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah.